Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are on the planet. Welcome to Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. This is the podcast conversation about accelerating the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society, and I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe. Thanks for joining the conversation today. Reuse is the most effective way to reduce environmental impacts. Passing along a product to someone else, whether that's in your family, your company, or in your community, avoids the need to extract virgin resources from the environment to make something new, and it extends the useful life of a product, which helps turn the wheels of life without adding to carbon emissions. The reuse movement is growing fast, and we'll talk today with a pioneer who started the world's largest reuse marketplace with just 800 pounds. That's about $1,000. May Alkalruni is the CEO of Globechain.com. It's a British reuse marketplace that operates with the mission of connecting corporations, charities, and individuals to facilitate the redistribution of unwanted items. It focuses on a variety of sectors, including retail, with items like fixtures and fittings, as well as commercial items such as office and IT equipment, and construction materials, as well as demolition waste. Nonprofits and individuals can browse the site to find free stuff, which they must pick up, but otherwise there's no cost involved for the recipient of the materials. Globechain aims to create a global supply chain network that enables the reuse of items, generating waste audits and social impact value for its members. The platform is designed not just to facilitate the exchange of goods, but also to help companies and individuals reduce their environmental footprint by finding innovative reuse solutions for items that they otherwise would send to a landfill. Globechain has proven to be a valuable resource for its members, which include over 10,000 organizations, by connecting them with companies who are willing to donate items that can be reused in various sectors, including healthcare, small business, and community projects. And the economics of Globechain are ingenious, as companies are the ones who pay to list the items that they're going to give away. In return, they get credits and ESG reporting data about what they gave away on the platform. Globechain operates in Britain, Spain, the United Arab Emirates, and New York. And during 2024, the company is expanding its services in the United States. You can learn more about Globechain at Globechain.com. Globechain's all one word, no space, no dash. Globechain.com. Now, let's start the conversation with May, but first, a quick commercial break. Welcome to the show, May. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Well, I'm I'm very well. Thanks for joining us this morning to talk. Uh, you know, I, Globe Chain is really interesting. Uh, the largest reuse marketplace in the world. I, I learned about it just a few weeks ago from you, and I wanted to find out, what was your aha moment? that led you to start a company and and with your own money? Yeah, so um, exactly kind of eight, nine years ago now, um, I used to work for an investment bank. And um, the irony is we used to deal with property funds and venture capital and, you know, different types of funds. We moved across the road and kept the buildings. Um, And they came around and basically said to us, you know, pick your new carpet color tile, you know, blue or light blue, Uh, pick your table, chair and so on. And I said, well, what are you going to do with all this furniture? Like, you're just not going to just take it across the road and you use it and you know at that time sustainability wasn't a thing uh Mm -hmm. you know the closest thing sustainable was csr and that was more hr focused reuse wasn't even a word that also the economy and um and they said no we're going to just dispose of it um and you know banks at that time did that you know they had a lot of money to spend and a lot of companies did the same and i just thought that was really like commercial madness because they told me it cost around fifty thousand dollars per person to make the move you know that's everything logistics buying new assets and so forth and um, I just thought god that could go to somebody you know that needed it in the community a charity a non-profit um, a small business an individual and I just thought why no one digitalize waste and very simply connected corporate enterprises with non-profits small businesses and people and it was the time Airbnb and Uber were just becoming famous in the UK um, becoming quite big and I just thought you know what let me have a go and um I naively thought I could get funding for it like every startup would because I worked in the industry and um I quickly got a no this is not a business model and it will never work and um and I thought you know what I think it will because I've been talking to a few companies so um I put my own money in to start it off 
Now you've raised about uh, 750,000 pounds, which is roughly $950,000 if I'm doing the math right yeah. so far. Yeah. That's a lot of progress on a small foundation. Are you breaking even at this point? Yes, we are. And um, it's kind of bittersweet because, uh, you know, like every business knows, it's very hard to get investment, never mind being female, ethnic minority and so on. Um, but the challenges economically in the market, are uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult for uh, startups, especially in the sustainability or social impact space, um, to raise any money because these business models are new business models. So um, mm -hmm. we've kind of been forced to be very innovative with the way that um, you know, we've kind of operated the business, created the business model, generated revenue. So from day one, I actually incorporated um, a revenue structure into the business because I wasn't going to um, rely on funding from the private sector, whether that venture capital angel investors to do it, because it was very early days of that industry as well. Um, and angel investors now are very accessible. There's networks, there's big mm -hmm. communities. When I started, it wasn't really like that. It was about who you knew. And I didn't know any. <laughs> now, but that, you know, that, that's a really important point. VCs, investors generally are backward looking when they're think, considering yeah. business. They're looking for an established business model. Um, how did you break through and what kinds of investors have you been able to attract to the to the company? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question because a lot of people at the beginning thought we were a non-profit, um, mm -hmm. you know, because we had the philanthropic side of we're not selling anything. We're giving assets, inventory and items for free. So it was very difficult to change the mindset of a lot of these venture capital funds who, as you said, initially will look at a spreadsheet of yeah. a known business model and go, well, we know how they've made money and how much money is needed to make them a billion. And let's just replicate that with this company that's doing something very similar, but it's pink or blue or purple in color you know it's it's pretty much that that's the way they work and you know over the years they have been a little bit greedy and over evaluate evaluated companies um so um for me it was about um put, pushing it in front of somebody that could see the vision um mm. of what we were trying to do and i was very lucky because um, I was told that they invested in me at the time because it was just me really running the business early days. Um, you know, a few contracted out um, um, uh, staff, but um, I was the only one employed and I didn't I didn't take a salary for four years. So I bootstrapped it. And, um, you know, they were just kind of amazed at the speed and how much I actually did <laughs> with no money <laughs> and um, and then and invested in me. But they weren't social impact investors, which is very interesting because a lot of people were saying, have you looked at social right. impact investors? And there weren't actually that many. And at the time, I actually thought, you know what? This is for something that shouldn't have a social impact investor. It should mm -hmm. have a, a an investor that doesn't label themselves as anything agnostic because if they think that's a business model for the future, then it is one. I don't need a social impact fund to tell me that. You, you, you know, a lot of ways just describe my last six years at Earth 911. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, your business model is really interesting because companies are literally listing to give stuff or paying to list something that they give away. So tell us how the Globechain platform works for the company. What's the what's the what's the experience? Yeah, so they pay an annual or a project fee to list the items. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in essence, it's very simple, mobile, iPad, computer. They take photos of the items that don't they don't want. So normally it's within retail and construction, um, hospitality or medical equipment. So anything that they would normally incinerate or dispose of or pay a waste company to remove, not things that they would uh, get a value back on high value goods, which they would obviously sell. But it's that in-between almost like too good to throw away not good enough for like ebay is is our saying and as you know large companies don't use ebay they won't use facebook groups um big compliance reasons health and safety many many different sure. reasons um and so what they do is they just take a photo list it. it's very simple we have machine learning in the system that recognizes the products as well and um, once it's listed 30 seconds um we send alerts out to all our members. So we have over 10,000 of these nonprofits and small businesses and wow. individuals, and they're very quick. It takes an average in the UK and Europe about 20 minutes for items to be requested. Um, and I'm talking a hundred chairs or two chairs or 10,000 carpet tiles or lighting. Um, 20, we have minutes. To pay 20 minutes is the average request time on the system for these free items. And That's all we common. ask, 
it is it's re and, and that's network effect for you right and it's, yeah. it's also you know there is a demand for those types of products particularly in the construction and built environment industry where there's a lot of waste um mm -hmm. you know it's very high in carbon and it's perfectly good materials sometimes and very expensive to buy so these organizations take it for free the only uh, requirement we ask is that when they request it and get booked in they pick it up and they pay for their own logistics in doing so. So we can right. offer third party logistics companies or they can obviously that they can organize themselves. And then on the back of that, our USP is we generate um, social impact data called ESG, which stands for Environment Social Governance Data. And that's used on really high level with bond financing, credit risk, IPO share pricing, as well as tax offsetting for the nonprofits. And, um, and also um, in construction, you can get credits called lead points on there as well. Fascinating. I, the other thing that I was curious about is you have an internal reuse and loaning programs for corporate customers. What do those yeah. look like? So you're also being paid to manage the internal exchange of assets? Yes. So um, we found while creating the external that we couldn't grow big enough for all these global companies that wanted mm -hmm. every country everywhere at the same time. So we suggested and there was a demand for an internal system where it was a private network for these global enterprises where they have multiple locations in, say, a country or a region or a state. And they want to reuse their assets and inventory first internally within themselves or their own supply chain. So we can connect external individuals as long as they agree internally. Um, and also they can involve their employees as well, like employee benefit. So they can offer things for reuse and loaning inside the organization or its own network and contractors and vendors. Um, and then they can press a button and they can offer it to Joe Public, which is our external platform. And that's grown, I'd say, the last four or five years um with with companies looking for global solutions this idea of an internal loaning process that then is transparent and can become a public loaning or, or, or a giveaway is really a, an important way of thinking about understanding the data around the assets that an, a, an organization owns at this yes. time that's different than anything i've ever heard uh, yeah it, it's a it's treating the assets as a, a benefit that can be shared with others. The way, in a sense, that nature helps organisms occupy niches within the ecosystem, this is a way of recasting the flow of stock through the economy for potential reuse. Did that, how did you develop that idea? Did, did that, I mean, it was a day one you thought this is how we'll do it, or how did it evolve over time? Um, no, it actually evolved. The external was first uh, because there was a demand to offer things to nonprofits because people felt safer offering to nonprofits. But then as we started monitoring like people's behavior on the system, we were getting suppliers and, you know, building contractors, um, giving it to other building contractors that you would technically class as competition, um, sure. which was very interesting. So it showed that the industry had changed over time. You know, there's many drivers for companies to, to reuse now rather than recycle um you know policy drivers um industry drivers and obviously fines and consumers um based on you know the ethos and the values of a company so um recycling has become more expensive so what we're finding is companies are looking internally first at the value of their assets to see if they can basically amortize that that kind of depreciation and value internally first and whether that's a, a straight kind of we've got this product we move it to this location therefore it saves us x amount of dollars because we didn't buy that product for the other location or it's a matter of say we have we work with warehouses that move and loan assets and inventory to retailers mm -hmm. and um, you know like fashion shows and events so they're not having to buy the goods again and they know exactly where their assets are so it's, it's about tracking and also something called material passporting which yep. is emerging and material passporting is basically getting the composition of your asset or inventory and knowing exactly what it's made up of so in the future as circularity um, advances there's going to be technology that could 
break down that material in a way that is low carbon, beneficial, modular, and so and so on. Um, and um, material passporting has never been done in the past because it never really need there was a need to exist for you know reuse and and you know uh, consumerism really. But now we've just got too much of everything. Um, so so that's we we collect that data as well. That's fascinating. And the other thing you told me is that you can provide scope three emissions data to your customers as well. I, I presume that is avoided emissions uh, reporting that you're you're giving them. Is that the case? Yeah, it's carbon deferral. So it's based on the transaction of like reuse of the item through the system. So we incorporate a little bit of logistics into that. Um, we break down, we, we've done a lot of studies and um, methodology on basically this scientific breakdown of all the gases and how it, if it would have been disposed of. So we get audited on that every year to ensure that our carbon data is accurate mm -hmm. and within industry standards. And that is given within the reporting for these companies and it's quite a powerful um metric when you actually see you know it can be a small quantity of items but the carbon is very high on it because that would have been broken down and if the composition of those materials are unknown plastics and a mix that can't be recycled well well surely that's better for it to keep in circulation and extend the life cycle of that product rather than you know the emissions so um, that's a new thing that we've been doing for the last two years. And uh, companies now, because they've been creating more tar carbon zero targets, mm -hmm. it's becoming quite a powerful metric that they appreciate because it's actually very complicated to, to work out. You know, it's not just a, a coding algorithm <laughs> through the system. Well, as you prepare to expand in the US more broadly, how large is the organization today and how large do you expect you'll be in, say, a year or so? Yeah, well, we're hoping to expand in 10 to 20 um, cities in the US um, mm -hmm. this year. Um, it would be a, it'll be a, a lot faster than we have been doing because we have um, a very robust system in place. And also the US has um, caught up, if you like, with UK and Europe with respect to sustainability and ESG. So mm -hmm. there are now budgets in place. Um, and it's, a, it's a, it was a similar pattern in the UK when we first started in Spain. You know, people didn't really have budgets for sustainability because it wasn't really taken seriously. But now, you know, there are serious budgets in place and people know how to allocate their funds and are looking for solutions. So um, we want to move really quickly in the US and we think we can as well. I, I'm I'm gratified to hear that Europe thinks that we're doing well and catching up. Um, <laughs> There's usually a lag of three to six months. We find in in uh, probably more policy and education. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here. We're going to take a quick commercial break and be right back. Now let's get back to the discussion with May Al Kalruni. She is CEO of the British reuse marketplace Globe Chain, now expanding its reach to more than 20 cities in the United States, uh, according to what we just heard a moment ago. So May, uh, you're creating an ecosystem. Uh, you're knitting something new in, in human experience. It's, congratulations. Tell us about the how individuals and nonprofits are interacting with the system. How are they saying, I need this and signaling their intention uh, to acquire something so that they can offset it by getting something that's been reused. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's there's two ways we're seeing the behavior of nonprofits and organizations using the site. We're seeing there's a lot more referral um, and recommendation and organic growth of mm -hmm. people coming on board. So it's about 40% a month on new recipients coming on. So people are telling people about the amazing things they got off Globe Chain, which is really nice. And as well as clients using the system, realizing, wow, this is this stuff's going very quickly. I can't believe somebody wanted this broken random and water valve you know it's that kind of thing so it's the stories that are created um but also the members can um set up very specific alerts for either categories or specific items they're looking for so they can okay. have daily or an, a weekly alerts um and that's that's generally how it works and um we find no one really unsubscribes because they're wanting to know what comes up every day uh, whether that's out of curiosity or um you know a need or a demand for something but it's pretty incredible the volumes that they're willing to take and 
Um, I didn't explain it earlier, but when we uh, collect that data, every mm -hmm. member that picks up items from the site has to give us a little case study. So we get really beautiful stories and photos and videos of before and after and what they did with the items. And that really encourages them to, to use the site more. And also the company, um, you know, puts a nice warmth smile um, at, at the end of the day, we're all human. And um, it, it's a really lovely impact. That's a really interesting. So in a sense, the process also generates the marketing that uh, attracts more people yes. and organizations to the platform. Yeah. And it's about and trust, right? It's like, sure. oh, what? really? Do I not need storage? I can't believe I'm going to get rid of, you know, 200 window frames. Um, yep, you can. <laughs> Somebody oh, well, I wants them. Yeah. The trust utility value is the absolute essence of a good network uh, uh, before without trust, no one will participate. I had that experience recently when I moved. I was I listed things on buy nothing groups. And I frankly got the impression that no one believed that the offers were real. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting. We had the same thing when we um, launched in New York. So it was in COVID, in mm -hmm. between COVID. And um, we had a luxury um, retailer um, that had a lot of um, materials, like brand new, very expensive carpet tiles, a whole American diner, chessboard sets, chaiselongs, like these items a, are very expensive to buy, were probably used for 20 minutes in a fashion show, and they were sitting in their warehouses gathering dust, and then eventually they've kind of got no more use to them once they've used them a few times, so they needed to dispose of them. And um, we couldn't say who this retailer was to the members. They just had to turn up to the warehouse when they were booked in. But it took a, um, a bit of persuasion to say this is genuine stuff. And it is as good as you see in the pictures. And please go, please spend some money and go with your transform pickup. And when they saw who it was, um, they were super happy. And then obviously they started using it on a regular basis. But um, but there is sometimes like you can't believe what's been put on, you know. The other element of, of making this sustainable is trying to connect uh, resources to users as close to one another as possible so that you're yes. short transportation chain how do you do that uh, and and yeah. particularly as you think about expansion how do you target markets where you believe you can drive a lot of inter intra market activity yeah well um we, you know we, we've had now got eight years experience so um the t the team are super skilled at knowing how to grow markets whether that's remotely or on the ground and um you know we rely heavily on digital marketing referral good mm -hmm. reputation actually shouldn't be underestimated um with people talking about it but what we do is we we look at areas where there are people in demand or visits to us website and then we build a network around clients that want to start listing in that area so usually it's the client that dictated to us in the past where we would set up um, a region or a city because the client's like hey you know we've got three locations there can you do something around here and we're like let's see what type of network we can build around you and then we build up once we build that network up there's a tipping point to it and then it flows on its own and then you can start building up supply and demand in a balanced way um so most um, countries and cities in the world can work like that. There are obviously cultural differences, say for Germany, for, you know, where the language, there's few language barriers. So, you know, things like translating the site or understanding the cultural dynamics of how people donate in those countries is important. Now, do you see individuals and small businesses as a source of revenue in the future if they want to list things? Is, is yes. that growth strategy? Yeah, so um, so we're doing actually two things. One, um, to, to list at the moment is in UK and Spain, you pay. We're actually mm -hmm. opening it up for free in the US uh, to get people yeah. listing and using the system for a limited period. Um, from um, a non-profit and or, um, small business side, because they are taking, so they are already spending on the logistics. But what we do offer, and it's optional, is data for the IRS for them to report the values for offsetting on their tax um, forms, as well as internal data, whatever internal data they need for their audits. So that's what we um, we have available for them, but they can actually register for free, take for free. They just have to pay for their own transport. So how many people have used Globechain to find these, these items? 
Oh my gosh. Well, we have, yeah, over 10,000 members, but to give you an idea, it's over 65 million kilos. So that's just over 5 million different types of items. Um, mm -hmm. People that have benefited from it is is slightly different. It's calculated slightly different through like a government um, social impact formula. And um, it's we've calculated it's over, um, gosh, I think it's like um, 400 million people have benefited directly and indirectly through items. So you're projecting from the uh, the organization's impact to the actual population that is benefiting from the materials that's traded. Yeah, there's obviously a direct impact with the kilos and the carbon for the organization, but also there's a saving for the recipient um, because they didn't have to buy those products um, on the market. So we use machine learning to get real time values for that. But also there's the intangible impacts like did it help with upskilling, employment levels, grant funding? And we ask the recipient that information, you know, how did it help? And, and we calculate it. And sometimes it helps communities. Right. So if people are taking tables for for example, it goes to a school. Well, that school has, you know, 200 children in it. So how many of those children actually physically benefited of those tables? There's obviously a cost saving involved, but from an education, what was that benefit? And so we try and calculate that to give an indication of the indirect impacts longer term as well. You know, I, I want to turn back to the fact that you're expanding in the States, but tell us how the UK, Spain, UAE, and New York became your initial target markets. It, it, it's, it's a bit yeah. eccentric of a footprint. I know, right? So that wasn't one day I thought, let's do these places. <laughs> I assure you. Um, but um, not, in, not the places you just first. wanted to visit? Yeah, I know. Well, they are very nice places um, and definite places you'd, you'd love to live. But um, no, it was actually clients. So clients that we had in the UK had branches in, say, Spain and would be like, can you now do Madrid and Barcelona? Uh, can you do this? And we'd be like, why not? And the beauty of it was that they knew we weren't in those countries. So we already had the trust um, and the support, if you like, of that pioneering company who mm -hmm. knew that we would need to almost like start from scratch and build a, a network for them again. So there's a lot of patience when they're listing items initially, because if you think about it, you're going on an empty site mm -hmm. in Spain, you're listing. So you, you, you won't get that 20 minutes uh, straight away unless we had a network built around it so that was very important to have that good relationship um, and, and the same with UAE we were approached by a couple of really big organizations out there and actually one of the royal families asked us mm -hmm. to um, work with them and the um, the nonprofits that were like semi-government um, in the UAE um, so that again that's how that came about and that's an internal system and then New York again was um, a couple of clients from the UK had had um their, their counterparts if you like asking uh -huh. okay can we can we do it in new york so state as you look at the united states right now where do you think you're going to be uh in the next six to eight months yeah i'd love to reach out to you know 10 10 cities or regions in the east coast and 10 west coast um and and texas does um, quite well for us we get a lot of interest in texas so it's it's uh, picking the the cities that not necessarily are densely populated but may have warehousing or our existing clients have locations there and and with then we can start growing from that but also the small businesses locally in that area are really powerful because we see a lot of giving and taking between them and they don't really have solutions or the budgets of these big, big companies um when it comes to waste disposal so i think we can really help that and and you know it's really about marketing getting on the ground and mm -hmm. and just them knowing we're there really now you're already trading a lot of different materials uh, as you imagine your growth what kinds of reuse do you envision global ch globe chain facilitating as as you continue to grow what other yeah. what other stuff can go through the platform yeah, so um, we've seen a transition from people think we just do furniture and computers, but mm -hmm. uh, most of our items, about 70% is from the construction and real estate mm -hmm. world. So it's things like fixtures and fittings from shops, carpets, ceiling tiles, flooring, kitchen units are very popular, lockers. Um, we've done even crazy things for airports. We work with Heathrow Airport. We've done water valves with them. Um, um, we've done materials under railway tracks. Um, yeah, you name it, whatever it was, someone knows somewhere they, how they can use it. Um, and uh, there's been some really cool things made out of them. So there's water valves, very rusty, very old. They're not going to be sold as a water valve. Uh, they went 
to um, uh, a, a, a youth um, center that taught apprenticeships how to upcycle them and make coffee tables and sell them as micro businesses. So they basically put glass on them and made them like really retro coffee tables. Um, another time we had an air bridge, uh, you know, the bridge that you walk on the planes with. Right. Yeah. yeah, they're very expensive metal. Um, and um, we had um, a company that uh, buys plane parts and converts them into like eco hotel rooms. And then they took one of those as well. Um, uh, that was a very tricky job and things like gazebos, um from from beauty retailers have gone to school playgrounds and or regeneration projects so uh, people are really imaginative when it comes down to um you know taking stuff off and 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 then there's just really simple stories like you know um i remember hurricane harvey uh mm -hmm. caused a big problem in the states and two years later we had people requesting furniture from a bank um, saying that they needed it because they were still um, recovering from the effects of Hurricane Harvey. And that was like two years before. I mean, it was crazy. And these were individual homes. Yeah, this is it's, it's remarkable. The idea that you could spawn these reuse activities simply by making the materials visible. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So there are a lot of other efforts to do more closed loop reuse programs, you know, local programs like for yeah. dishes, food service items, and other single-use products. What do you imagine the barriers are to sharing those things? Or rather, what are the imagine what, what barriers are you thinking about tearing down? Yeah. So so um all those kind of projects and community and localized giving and repair is is amazing. And you know, people um, you know, have have I really admire people that can spend time doing that in on a small scale and putting their own money behind it. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're looking at things kind of commercially, because we're a commercial entity, you've got to look at the scalability of that. And I think that's mm -hmm. where kind of technology comes in and makes things easier. So that all those people could still do that, but have a platform, i.e., something like Globe Chain, a marketplace where they can shout about it and reach so much more people, and it can still be localized right but it's less effort and it's quicker and more efficient um what we find with those small groups is they usually set themselves up as non-profits and then you have the competition of trying to get funding from local uh, yeah. government sponsorship and, and 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 it's it's really painful for them you know fundraising is not fun for anyone <laughs> and and i think that's a big barrier to those they never seem to grow big enough or if they have grown we've seen projects in say new york where um the, the the governor of new york has given money for a project to like three million pounds a year for a warehouse and then suddenly that budget's cut and and gone somewhere else and then that nonprofit can't function anymore um and it but me it may have done amazing impact in the community so i'd say those are the type of barriers for that reason we can still be localized there's mm -hmm. still still localized um, supply chain, if you like. Um, it's just done on a system that um, we try and make efficient and easy to use for anyone, right? Whether you're um, older, younger, a technophobe can use technology or not. So that's where that's how we come in as an enabler. Well, the the information flow is absolutely critical, but as I'm struck as you're talking about this and, and your comments about local reuse programs is that they tend to be very specialized and they set up their own infrastructure rather than looking for shared infrastructure. One of the challenges, particularly here in the United States that we see is, is we talk about extended producer responsibility, yeah. is that you see it applied only to one industry, such yes. as or carpet, or rather than thinking about how do we take EPR commitments by companies and use them to build a more robust not just a recycling system but a reuse system yeah and, and so it, really what we need to do is explode the silos as best we can is yes. that you see the evolution of the reuse economy accelerating yeah, absolutely it's 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 changed so much the last couple of years um, and it's accelerated and you know we've benefited from that you know where where most markets are struggling we're not struggling in that in that way um you know mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot out there and what we find are people are very open now to collaborate or look at alternatives before they'd be like oh we recycle or we do this or we do that um now they're coming to us and going we know you're the largest. We know you do reuse really well. We've heard, 
uh, we we now have a project can we try it and mm -hmm. um and and we've we've had one client where we would never ask for like uh stay, steel steel bars because steel mm -hmm. is an expensive commodity um people recycle it they can get a lot of money for it themselves through brokers and so we've never promoted anything like that through globe chain because we just make an assumption that you've already got something in place that works mm -hmm. and you're happy with um this particular client says can we try and put some steel beams on the system and obviously they got taken um but it was really interesting to understand um their mentality and 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 what made them change their mindset to now thinking okay they're still the value of those steel beams to us is not worth it anymore for whatever reason but guess what mm -hmm. the esg and the impact and the carbon is more valuable to us now if we gave it away than if we sold it and the transparency of where it's gone so something very interesting is happening in the market. So as you see the rise of carbon credits and other forms of credit for uh, avoided emissions, for instance, yeah, that strikes you as a catalyst for a rapid expansion of this function within the economy. Uh, absolutely. As well as like bonds, you know, ESG bonds, carbon mm -hmm. bonds mm -hmm. in the market. I'm seeing a lot of banks looking at financing for carbon credit companies and projects. So um, there's a movement there and we normally see that. Uh, and I, I believe it will be like 18 months before that really hits kind of mainstream market. But what's interesting is there's not that negativity or skepticism anymore about that market and that economy and it being, oh, we're not sure it's not regulated. And the, there's actually been a lot of talk because of the controversy around certain articles that have been in the press about come credits on standardizing yeah. or different registries working together to to um, basically formulate and and say okay this is this is how we're gonna um regulate it really going forwards i i, I certainly hope we see that soon because it's yeah. very much needed as you think ahead and let's just look out 10 years where yeah. do you see globe chain in the global supply chain yeah, I would I would love it to be all across the US and um, plus another content, maybe Asia um, in the next kind of um, couple of years for sure. And and us to be known as like the world leaders of, of reuse and connecting these people together for the ESG. You know, our ultimate goal is like a world without waste. Right. So if we can achieve that. Um, you know, I'm happy because, you know, like any business, we will evolve as well. And um, what Globe Chain is now may not be what Globe Chain is three to five years time, hopefully, because people have reused everything and technology has become more sophisticated. Congratulations on already being ready to pivot. I mean, that, <laughs> oh, they, I know, that right? <laughs> real courage just to think that way. Yeah. Uh, obviously, people are going to want to sign up and, and try this, and, and they're going to want to follow along. How can people get involved with GlobeChain and follow your work? Yeah, very simple. Um, just go onto the website, www.globechain.com. And um, if you're in the US, please contact us through the form because we can offer you free listings uh, straight away. So you won't have to pay anything, which is always nice um, to get it going. And obviously um, refer as many people as you can to it, whether that's nonprofit, a small business that might want to take something as well. And always, always um, up for feedback on how we can improve things for everyone too. May, it's been a, an incredibly interesting discussion. Thanks so much for spending time with us. No, thank you for having me. That was my conversation with May Al Kalruni. She is CEO and founder of GlobeChain, which is a remarkable reuse marketplace that's expanding in the United States after operating in Britain, Spain, and the United Arab Emirates, as well as New York for the past half decade or so. You can learn more about and explore what's available for free to nonprofits and individuals at globechain.com. Globechain's just one word, folks. No space, no dash. Globechain.com. You know, I've, I've compared the emerging circular economy to nature's ability to spawn users of any waste material many times. And I think Globechain is a unique example of how providing a signaling capability within the economy can spawn users of materials that would otherwise go to waste or end up in landfills and worse in the environment. It's an example of how information technology can bridge the gaps in human economies to create real and local circularity for materials, from furniture and computers to, as we heard, rusted pipe fittings. Who would have thought? E.M. Forrester wrote in Howard's End, and I quote, only connect. 
That was the whole of her sermon. Only connect the prose and the passion, and both will be exalted, and human love will be seen at its height. Live in fragments no longer. I get the sense that Globechain has found the alchemy that will allow us to live in fragments no longer. And as May and I discussed, that progress requires continuing to break down the silos that separate industries. Looking beyond recycling or reusing only one type of material or waste product at a time, and instead facilitating a wide, deep, and robust infrastructure for turning what is used into something that can be reused. So check out Globechain and stay tuned for more conversations about the revolution in our relationship with the leftovers of the industrial economy. We have the opportunity to be the first generation to live truly sustainably. So let's take that opportunity and run with it. I hope you'll take a moment to share this podcast or any of the more than 450 interviews that we have provided to you on sustainability in your ear. Folks, if you take a moment to write a review on your favorite podcast platform, it will help your neighbors find us. You are the amplifiers that can help spread more ideas to create less waste. So tell your friends, family, and coworkers they can find sustainability in your ear on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audible, or their favorite purveyor of podcast goodness. Thank you, everyone, for your support. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. This is Sustainability in Your Ear, and we will be back with another Innovator interview soon. In the meantime, folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day. <laughs>